easy navigation is as important as sailing gently because it's totally changed in the last decade or so and it's now easy and fun to do. The days of dead reckoning and celestial navigation were wonderful and fulfilling art forms but like steam trains, signal flags and Morse code they frankly have little relevance in 2024. The world has moved on and GPS combined with electronic charts displayed on chart plotters or even just tablets is here to stay. There is no point whatsoever in having a sextant and tables on board or indeed even paper charts although I confess I do have the relevant charts for around here um, on board under a, uh, under a bunk cushion but mainly because I already own them. Would I go out and buy them again? Probably not. So what do you need and what do you need to know? You need a primary navigation system which in a perfect world would be a multifunction chart plotter fixed close to the wheel or tiller loaded with the latest electronic charts purchased from CMAP, Navionics, Garvin, Raymarine, NOAA and so on. Plotters are not cheap and nor are the charts but at least with the charts you only need to buy them for the area that you're sailing in. The choice of chart plotter actually normally dictates which chart system will work with it so that's what you'll have to go with. Folks in IT say if you only have one copy then you do not have a copy at all. Well, you really should have at least one backup to your primary system. Some time ago my boat was struck by lightning and every single item of electronic apparatus was burnt out including those which were isolated such as a, a world band radio sitting on the saloon table. I was in sight of land so headed in that direction despite the compass being 20 degrees out after the strike. On another occasion after coming out of a Netherlands port in the North Sea there was a catastrophic short circuit in the boat's electrical system. Out of sight of land I was forced to turn around and use the compass to get myself back to port. There is pilotage and there is navigation. Pilotage is in close sight of land where you will probably be able to get a mobile phone signal so you can resort to Google Maps combined with a GPS app on your phone or tablet. A good backup for your primary electronic chart system. Navigation is out of sight of land and the backup needs a satellite signal beamed on board to a GPS receiver and linked to electronic charts. Now that can be a relatively cheap handheld marine GPS with a basic world chart on it or possibly a GPS and GPS dongle into a tablet or laptop. I have an old laptop uh, loaded with OpenCPN running CMAP93 with a 12 volt charger and a Chinese dongle stuck to the window. I actually sailed around the world with this as my private na primary navigation facility. Uh, the backup then was a sextant. CMAP93 was developed jointly by Russian and Americans back in 1993 as part of its promotion. The Russians sent out sample disks to all their potential customers which contained all the charts of the world and everybody nicked them of course and are still doing so today. The majority of ports, harbours and marinas actually have changed very little in the last 30 years and ocean depths have remained pretty constant. Okay, shifting sandbars are different and shifting sandbars shift with every gale. So even electronic charts are not that up to date for the next day or week or so after a gale. Waypoints are not little buttons floating around in the sea. Rather, a waypoint is a latitude and longitude position which relates to a point on an electronic or paper chart and you are the person who creates it. You put the waypoint there. Okay, there are several apps around which purport to create and set a safe course between two places and avoid obstacles and look at tidal streams. I think if you don't create the route yourself, then if the shit hits the van, you're not going to know the reason for every waypoint course change within that route. You're not going to know why it's there. 
So, following computer-generated courses is probably not that smart. It doesn't inform you about your passage plan. Now, for example, in this charted passage plan, um, Yarmouth Isle of Wight is the starting point and Sherbourne is the destination waypoint in this graphic. And there are a few waypoints in between. On your chart plotter, you can place a cursor on the electronic chart, click the mouse, and that establishes the first waypoint, and that's it. There will be a waypoint symbol, and if you access the information inside the waypoint symbol, you'll be given a latitude and longitude of the waypoint to um, an incredibly detailed um, position, accuracy. The waypoint you've created will appear in a list, probably with a default name like Waypoint 001, or just 001. It is a pain, but something you really should do is to change this default name of the new waypoint to something like Yarmouth HBR Harbour, or whatever takes your fancy and is memorable. If you don't do this, then you will eventually forget what waypoint 024 represents, and in a stressful situation, that's not helpful. The software will give you the option to create a route, which you should also name, and in this case, um, Yarmouth to Sherbourne. Another thing to be slightly aware of is that in UK and some European waters, the Greenwich Meridian runs through them, and it separates east from west in the same way as the equator separates north from south. So, in the UK near to New Haven, the Greenwich Meridian line, north-south line, runs close by, and you can find yourself to the east or west of Greenwich in a blink. So, the first waypoint entered into the GPS chart plotter memory as Yarmouth HBR, Yarmouth Harbour. Now you need to put in the next waypoint which will take you out into the Solent and down the Needles Channel and finally to the bar and then across the channel to Sherbourne. Personally, I do my entire route plotting on my laptop and then transfer the finished waypoints into a memory card and plug that into the plotter to transfer it. It can also be done with Bluetooth, I'm told. OK, naturally, the software varies from electronic chart plotter and electronic chart manufacturer, but in the end, it's basically all the same as this. This is a planned route from Yarmouth Harbour, UK, to Cherbourg in France. It's a total distance of 65 nautical miles, and at an average of 5 knots through the water, it's going to take you about 13 hours. You'll want to arrive in this foreign, strange port in daylight, uh, and remembering EU time is always one hour different from UK time all the year round. So the first issue is to find out when sunset will be at your planned arrival port, Sherbourne. When will it be sunset in Sherbourne? So, you Google on your chart plotter or your phone app, um, and that'll give you the sunset in Sherbourne, and it'll also give you the time for sunrise that day for Yarmouth Isle of Wight, which is also useful. So, you should plan to leave set sail at least 12 to 13 hours before sunset in Sherbourne. Clearly, you have to come out of Yarmouth Harbour and hang a left, but even that needs some care because there are mooring boys in Black Rock. Now, it's worth noting that the position of the course line goes over shallows of 0.8 and 0.1 metres, so if your boat draws much more than 0.1 of a metre, um, it would be better to put the waypoint on, say, Yarmouth Road Boy, then head for the next waypoint, clear of all the shallows, and indeed Black Rock. All charts have depths shown at lowest astronomical tide, which is the lowest height of water there can possibly be, more or less. Where the chart shows green patches, as at Black Rock, that means the area dries out around low water, at LAT, lowest astronomical tide, and it gets real shallow around it. 
at low water spring tides you'll frequently get very close to LAT. On neap tides, even at low water, the average boat drawing 1.5 metres will be probably okay around there because it's neap tides. The second waypoint should be placed in a position that will take you um, down the Needles Channel clear of all the obstacles. And then the next waypoint is near the uh, Needles Channel entrance buoy. Now, the chart shows some very shallow water over the shingles bank, so you need to be careful to avoid that. Alternatively, in good weather, it's possible to turn south for Sherbor a bit sooner over the bridge, which is between the Needles Passage Boys and the Lighthouse, a shallow water area. But it's probably better to avoid the WK in the middle of the bridge, which means wreck, or not. If you hover and click the cursor over WK, wreck, it will tell you exactly what it means, and in this case the depth of water over it, the minimum depth of water over it. This applies to every single on a symbol on an electronic chart. Just click on it and it will tell you what it means. Be aware that the Needles Channel is relatively narrow and it's between sandbanks on one side and rocks on the other. And be aware that there is a serious risk of big and confused waves over the shingles and the bridge if you have high winds over a wind over tide situation. In good conditions, it's all perfectly safe. The final waypoint on this planned route is Sherbor Eastern Outer Breakwater Entrance, although it's another 20 minutes at five knots from there to the marina entrance. And because you have to go through another inner breakwater, you might want to put this bit in as well um, on your chart plotter, just in case you do arrive in the dark. The yarmouth Sherbor route on your plotter information will now look something like this. But that's not the end of the tidal waters planning. The tidal streams are going to affect your timings a lot. For the first five or six miles of this passage, you need to try to make sure the tides are working for you and not against you. This is an ex excerpt from the tidal atlas for the Needles Passage. The numbers are the tidal strength. The numbers by the arrows are the tidal strength of the current. For example, the arrow with 1, 1, 2, 3. The figure 1, 1 equals 1 1.1 knots on a neap tide. The figure 2, 3 equals 2.3 knots on a spring tide. This is important if you're planning to depart Yarmouth a couple of hours after low water. On a spring tide, you'll be going in into up to 2.3 knots against you on the way to the bridge. Now, this is a distance of five miles, so if you're making around five knots through the water, your speed over the ground from Yarmouth Harbour to the bridge will be down to around 2.7 knots, or maybe less. Another 20 minutes or so, maybe even half an hour, onto your passage time to Sherbourne, changing it from 12 or 13 hours to 13 and a half hours. Even worse, at the north end of the Needles Channel, the tidal stream can reach a peak of 3.9 knots against you on spring tides, and this would make your speed over the ground just over one knot. Planning your departure time for a daylight arrival in Sherbor, you need to refer to the tidal atlas for the Solent area. Now, you can buy them on Amazon or from the Admiralty or uh, Chandler's, or you can look at them online in places like um, visitmyharbour.com or tidesforfishing.com, which has worldwide coverage. Now, I said before, navigation is an art and not a science, and it's influenced by tides and weather and by your knowledge of the capabilities of your boat and indeed your own knowledge and experience. 
just because the tidal stream is running against you for the first couple of hours at your departure point doesn't mean you shouldn't go. Maybe it means you should leave a bit earlier um, or maybe it means simply you should just bear in mind that it's going to be a bit slow for the first couple of hours. And then the tide's going to be with you so you'll probably make up that couple of hours because the tide's in your favour. Sir Francis Drake was playing bowls on Plymouth Hoe when he was told the Spanish Armada was in the channel and he's reported to have said time enough to play the game and thrash the Spaniards afterwards. A display of cool but in reality I suspect he knew exactly what time the tide would change and allow him to get his battle fleet out of Plymouth Harbour and that was not going to be for a few more hours. In order to navigate safely you need to know the difference between spring tides and neap tides. In places like the Needles Channel the tidal stream can run at speeds of 3.9 knots but in ordinary race or around Portland Bill it can run up to 9 knots yes 9 knots you would be going backwards very very fast a spring tide has got the biggest range and speed this means at low water a spring tide is very close to chart datum and at high water it's possibly lapping over the top of the harbour wall. It has the greatest range. A neap tide is milder and gentler and has a much smaller range. It doesn't drop anywhere near as close to chart datum at low water and it probably won't rise to more than halfway up this harbour wall. Um, at high water, neaps. In terms of speed, a neap tide is frequently half to a third slower than its big brother spring tide. The tides are uh, basically controlled by the gravitational pull of the moon. So when there's a full moon there are spring tides and when there's a new moon there are neap tides, more or less. Because this is a moon influence and the moon does various distance from the earth for various astronomical reasons I don't totally understand. Some spring tides are bigger than other spring tides and some neap tides are smaller than other neap tides. A good bit of news is that the speeds of tides increase in a predictable way during their six hour-ish cycle. The increase in height and speed is least close to high water and low water in the six hour cycle and it's at its greatest three hours in at the midpoint of the six hour cycle. Rather than looking up tables in books you can work out the six hour tidal heights and strengths for any particular moment by using the rule of twelfths. The first hour of the tide increases its strength or height by one twelfth. In the second hour it increases it by two twelfths and in the third hour it increases it by three, three twelfths. In the fourth hour it increases it by another three twelfths. In the fifth hour by two twelfths and in the sixth hour by one twelfth again, small amount. So tables are published each year giving the exact time of high water at certain places, um, certain ports. Uh, websites like visitmyharbour.com or tidesforfishing.com or Google will give you this information. Now in the channel the tides flow in one direction for six hours and then the other direction for the next six hours. Your 60 mile passage across the channel is around 11 to 12 hours at 5 knots average speed over the ground. As he said, the course from the Needles to Sherbourne East Outer Breakwater is 179 degrees. So the fastest way to get across the channel from the Needles to Sherbourne is to see at 179, virtually due south for around 12 hours. What's actually going to happen 
is that the tidal stream is going to push you first to one side of your course and then the other side. Because your compass heading of 179 south remains constant over the 12 hour period, the six hours of east going tide pushing you to the east will be cancelled out by six hours of the west going tide pushing you. So, on the other hand, if you linked your chart plotter to the helm of your boat through the uh, to the automatic pilot with Sherbor East outer breakwater as a destination, then the plotter will keep altering the heading to push the boat against the effect of the tidal stream. You will travel further because the software is keeping you on the run line, in this case the solid black north south line on this chart, and it will take you longer to get to your destination. I mean it's not that big a deal, but if you're heading for the Channel Islands around Alderney Race, well, that's pretty mega. For example, if you're planning your passage from uh, Sherboard Marina to St Peterport in Guernsey, which is around 45 miles, it's absolutely vital that you enter Alderney Race when there is a south-going stream. If you look at this page of the Tidal Atlas, you can see that leaving at the wrong time could turn a 45-mile, 9-hour passage into a 20-hour nightmare. So working the tide on this passage is not optional like the cross-channel situation. The planning from Sherbourg to Alderney goes something like this. It's about 12 miles from Sherbourg to the top of Alderney Race, which means it'll take you about two hours or so. The distance from the top of Alderney Race to Guernsey is about 25 miles, which equates to five hours or less with the tide with you. So you really want to be arriving at Alderney Race between high water and one to two hours after high water. You need to leave Sherbourg, which is two hours away, about one to two hours before. So you need to know what time high water Sher Sherbourg will be on your departure day. You can ask at the marina office or you can Google it or you can look it up on the app on your phone. For Thursday 28th the high water time is 10.27 so you would probably want to be heading um, heading out around 8 a.m. 0800 assuming an average speed of five knots. What the tide is doing applies equally to trips along the coast of the British Isles and it applies equally to motorboats as well as sailboats. It's often the basis of all your navigational decisions along with what's the weather doing. Yeah, perhaps it would be nice to have a tidal atlas on board for the area. The Admiralty publishes a bunch of them for all the UK and Channel Island areas at pretty exorbitant prices. Or you can access them free of charge at places like uh, Visit My Harbour and so on. Electronic charts are just copies of paper charts digitalised. With a paper chart you need to know how to place a position on a chart uh, and what is its latitude and longitude information uh, that probably was provided to you by GPS or a mobile device. Lines of latitude are marked on the left and right hand sides of the chart. Longitude is marked on the top and bottom. So the equator which stretches all the way around the world, the fattest part of the Earth, is uh, at a line of latitude that is zero degrees. Stretching northwards and southwards from the equator are lines of latitude um, 5, 10, 15, 20 and so on up to the two, up and down to the two poles. At the North Pole it's 90 degrees north and at the South Pole it's 90 degrees south. England's position is somewhere between 50 and 52 degrees north, whilst Inverness in Scotland is around 57.5 north. A degree has 60 minutes, so between 50 degrees north and 51 degrees north there are 60 nautical miles. A minute is one nautical mile and a nautical mile is near as damn it one land mile. The other thing you need to know about navigational charts is that because the Earth is round, they're a cheat in order to make 
charts be flat. Two charts reflecting the roundness of the earth would show lines of longitude and latitude as displayed on the mnemonic chart and they're impossible to work with. The Mercator chart has flattened the earth out and it makes all latitude and longitude lines parallel and at right angles at the cost of making places like Greenland appear enormous and bigger than Australia. Over 500 years ago this guy um, Gerardus Mercator invented the idea of flattening the globe out, spreading out the countries at the top and bottom so that it works like a flat paper chart. Lines of latitude are all equally spaced and accurate going north to south whilst lines of longitude are rubbish for measuring distance between two points on the chart. The degrees marked on the side will be in whole degrees on a chart of the world on a harbour chart in degrees, minutes and seconds. On the chart it's illustrated it's possible to measure degrees and minutes with great accuracy. Below the 12 degrees 40 minutes north, you can see the next number down is simply 35 minutes. So this is the distance on this section of the chart from north to south, 5 minutes, which equals 5 miles. Below the 12 degrees 40 minutes north, there are alternating dark and light shaded rectangular boxes. So each box represents 1 minute, which is 1 mile. You use the side of the chart, line up the parallel rules or dividers and you measure the distance. You can now transfer your GPS or other device latitude or longitude pretty accurately onto the paper chart. Okay, so that's measuring stuff on charts. The passage plan is actually not a very big, big deal. In the Western Mediterranean, there are relatively few dangers offshore, so as long as you keep a mile or so off the coast, you're probably going to be okay. It is sensible, however, to look at the marinas, ports and VHF frequencies near the route, just in case the weather deteriorates and you need to enter into one of them. I mean, for example, on this 35 nautical mile route passage plan, between Estepona and Ben Almadina, there is, for example, Puerto Penus, which is incredibly expensive and seldom has space for visitors except mega yachts. Capo Pina, for example, is a tiny little marina and quite shallow, and it might not have enough depth of water for your boat. But there are lots of other alternatives down that route. So that's part of passage planning, knowing that. Assuming your average boat speed is five knots, then the 35 mile passage from Estepona to Val Madina is going to take seven hours. So you need to plan your departure to arrive in Benal Madina at least a couple of hours before sunset in order to give you time to get parked up in daylight. Easy. Deduct seven or eight hours from sunset in Benal Madina, take off a couple more hours, check the weather forecast and go. If the wind is on the nose, your boat speed will be reduced and it'll take you a bit longer to get there, but that's all. If you want to learn the traditional paper chart navigation way of navigating, dead reckoning and celestial navigation, then buy copies of these two excellent books written by Mary Blewett. They make both subjects totally understandable and were written by a lady who was a most successful navigator in ocean races back in the day. I can't recommend them highly enough. This video was a sort of brief excerpt from my totally revised 2004 edition of Easy Navigation for Beginners, which goes into this entire navigation pilotage lark in more detail. If you've recently purchased uh, Easy Navigation for Beginners before I rewrote it in March of 24, then email me and I'll send you a replacement copy. If you want the full version of Easy Navigation for Beginners, which includes chapters on AIS, full set of trial charts, and far more detail than this video, then you can 
download it instantly from gentlesailing.com. I think navigation is a lot of fun and I find it very satisfying uh, when it works. Anyway, I hope you found this a bit interesting. I hope it hasn't been too boring. Fair winds. Bye. My library of digital sailing books is at gentlesailing.com so you can buy them as instant downloads. There's a link to a printer who can convert them to hard copy if that's what you prefer. I've just totally updated and republished French Canal Routes to the Mediterranean, which is now in its 12th edition and is fully up to date with new information, charts and pictures. Recently I published Your Boat in the Sun, which proved an instant popular success. It's about where to keep your boat in the Mediterranean or the Caribbean and the costs and the logistics involved. The Atlantic Crossing Guide has become a bestseller and it outsells most of the others, probably because it's arguably one of the most comprehensive guides to sailing to the Caribbean that's available. The Gentle Sailing Route to the Mediterranean is one of the most popular publications that I have. It describes how to coast hop all the way to Gibraltar without having to spend a night at sea. There are books about marinas in the Med, sailing in the Caribbean islands, as well as a book on simple navigation and even a Pacific Ocean crossing guide um, and a book about just living aboard a sailing boat. Anyway, it's all at gentlesailing.com. So please do pay the site a visit and browse through my publications if you have a moment. Thanks. Fair winds.